burden of proof on the atheist is simply too heavy for him to sustain. He would have to show that it is logically impossible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. And that's just pure speculation. No one has ever been able to show that that's logically impossible. So the real debate today concerning the problem of evil is whether or not the suffering in the world makes it improbable that God exists. And here all kinds of moves can be made, uh, I think, to suggest that if the Christian God exists, it's not at all improbable that we should find the world suffused with both natural suffering and, and moral evil. So that the evil and suffering of the world, I think, does not render improbable the existence of the Christian God. Now, I can't say very much about that this evening, but I've written on this in my published work, for example, in the book Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, as a lengthy chapter on this problem that I would uh, commend anybody who's struggling with this important objection. Thank you, Stanger. Would you like to respond? Well, I thought... Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I, I was responding. Excuse me, sorry. Next question. Um, Dr. Craig. Next question is for um, you, My question kind of... We've been talking about all tonight about maybe this omnipresent God, you know, the soul versus, you know, kind of figure of what is right and what is wrong. But my question kind of takes a little bit from, I'm going to steer away from Christianity for a second, kind of go for more of a scientific slash Buddhism type of, you know, feel to it. And could it be argued that the term God is not an all-powerful being the conscience, but rather kind of more of a state of eternal bliss, an energy go-between, you know, a stream of life, if you will, cycling through the planet at a constant rate, and that simply when we cease and we die, we don't necessarily, you know, like, we kind of more, kind of return to the stream of life to be recycled again, you know, almost as an energy to start a new life in the world. Could it be argued that that could be possible as well? Well, there's a number of questions really that are involved here. If the arguments that I've given are sound arguments, then they lead to a transcendent personal cause of space and time. And that's incompatible with the Buddhist view of reality, which holds that this force is ultimately impersonal and uh, that the universe is eternal in the past. Moreover, I think the doctrine of reincarnation, the idea that we're constantly recycled, is incompatible with the, the resurrection of Jesus. If you were to ask me why I don't believe in reincarnation, it would be on the basis of Jesus' resurrection. It shows that one doesn't come back to lead a new life again. Rather, the doctrine of the resurrection teaches that we will someday be judged for the life that we have lived in this body and that we're not going to get recycled in that way. So while those views are, are possible, I, I don't see any evidence for them. And the kinds of arguments that I shared tonight leads me to think that those views are not true. Well, it's true that what's happening recently uh, is there, uh, in, in the U.S., as people have been moving away from uh, traditional Christianity, they haven't all been moving to uh, atheism, unfortunately. Young people have been pretty much uh, moving away from Christianity, but they're moving, at least half of them are moving to atheism, and the other half are moving uh, to a more of a kind of thing called spirituality. And uh, I know that quantum mechanics again comes in in the, in, the, uh, in the claims that people make, that we make our own reality based on quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics shows we're part of some cosmic consciousness and so on, and that's uh, again, there's, that's a whole different subject that I write a lot about, uh, and uh, there's no basis uh, uh, to assume that uh, there is some kind of cosmic consciousness out there. But it's another, the other thing to point out is that the Eastern philosophy does have a different view of the afterlife than uh, uh, we have in, in Christianity and in Judaism and in, in Islam. And that is, uh, in the Eastern view, the soul does not go to heaven as an individual soul, but gets, gets uh, uh, suffused throughout all the other, uh, the other souls. So there's a fundamental difference in the, in the two. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Singer, how can you uh, validate the truthfulness of any statement if you're basing the idea of truth just upon a materialistic worldview? That is, 
is if you say that the things that we're speaking, the things that we believe is true, are only the, the process of the you know the chemical imbalance or the chemical balances in our head and the firings of neurons, how can you trust that that how can, how is that a basis for truth in the world? Is it, I mean if that's all that's going on, isn't aren't we just programmed to say what we're saying? Well, uh, we have this materialist view, and I, I do not uh, claim that if you find evidence, I'm not, I'm not close to all possible evidence that, uh, that might uh, refute that view. I'm, uh, scientists uh, will be perfectly happy to find evidence uh, for a spiritual component of life, let's say. Because think of all the, all the wonderful uh, funding that would become available. Uh, for, uh, there's nothing more important than research science than uh, funding. So uh, everybody would jump on the bad way if that happened. The only, the only problem is you have to be, we have to be good scientists, and good scientists have to go where the, the data go. And, and uh, the data so far are perfectly consistent with a purely material universe. I think you've raised a really good question that presses very hard on the materialist. Namely, if we are just matter in motion, just electrochemical machines, then everything we think is determined by our stimuli and our genetic makeup. And in that case, why well, think that your views are true? Because they're just determined. They're like a tree growing a branch or a tooth having a toothache. And there's no reason to think anything that you believe is true. Indeed, there's no reason to think that materialism is true. So that it becomes a self-defeating view. Similarly, on materialism, everything that we believe, our cognitive faculties, are selected by evolution for survival value, not for truth. And so our beliefs that we hold today are held because they help us to survive. And that may be quite incidental to their being true. So that you can't really know on naturalism or materialism that anything you believe is true, including naturalism itself. So this is really a very, very naughty problem for the materialist or the naturalist. It's not a question of truth. It's a question of what fits the data, what agrees with the data. We have a model and it works. If that's the difference between science. Science, we don't accept science on the basis of faith the way you accept uh, uh, belief in God on the, on the basis of faith, you accept science because it works. It's a, it's a model of, of the universe that so far has, has, has done the job for us. But, but you're not an anti-realist, are you, Vic? I mean, you believe that galaxies exist, for example. Don't you think that's true? Not just that it works? Well, the galaxies are part of the model we built to describe reality. Now, I agree that they, they probably come close to what exists out there in reality, but we don't, when we get down to the subatomic level, there's all kinds of different theories that, shoot, that uh, describe the same phenomena, and uh, ultimately we really don't know what's behind the observations that we make. There's a phenomenal world of observations, and there's something behind that. Now, you would say that there's the, uh, there, there's the uh, spiritual world, the, World of well, I'd say there's a physical world, too. I mean, I'm a, I'm a realist when it comes to science. I think that it's really true that dinosaurs once walked the Earth. It's true that galaxies exist uh, and things of that sort, not just that these work. There, there, there are truths about the world that science apprehends. Well, that's, I'm not denying that, but I'm saying that when you put the whole story together uh, with science, there are many aspects of it that that you can't uh, state with that kind of, uh, of certainty. The way you can with the dinosaurs and with the, and with the moon uh, being really uh, some sphere out there to a good approximation. So uh, uh, if there, are, there are things at the fundamental level that, that we can't uh, pin down with that kind of precision. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left in the debate. It's been a wonderful debate tonight. We're going to have to ask our last question of the evening. I'm sorry, folks who have been waiting in line. Just the nature of the debate. Everybody wants to ask a question. I'm sorry we have a limited time tonight. So this will be our last question of the night. Dr. Dr. Craig, there's been a number of books written on near-death experiences. I think there was a lady named Betty E. Maybe 
American woman who had a near-death experience. She lived in Washington. I wondered if you cared to comment on um, the uh, fact of near-death experiences that people have had. I'm sorry, in a sense, this is the last question because my answer is no, I, I don't care to comment on that. It's not an area of expertise for me or an area of interest. I haven't looked into it. Uh, I know Vic Snicker's done some work on that, but I have nothing uh, to contribute to that particular topic. Sorry. Yes, well, I have looked into that a lot recently because there's been these books that have appeared in my area that I always work on is, is where claims are made in science that uh, there's evidence for something beyond what we, uh, we already uh, know. And I'm very interested in that kind of claim. Now, there's definitely uh, uh, the near-death experiences is, is a real phenomenon. People do have these experiences, and they come back in many cases changed. And there's a large number of people working on near-death experiences. Uh, they've been collecting data for 30 years. There's a, there's they have a journal of their own, uh, the Journal of Near-Death Studies. And if you look at the Popular books on the subject, there's tons of popular books on the subject all claiming uh, evidence for an afterlife. Uh, but when you look at the actual published results in, in, the, in the Journal of Near Death Studies, which is a, it is a respectable journal, uh, the experts in the field, and most of the people who work in this field, really would like to prove that there's something beyond uh, the, uh, that these people are, are uh, experiencing. But that just hasn't been anything that we, uh, anybody again has come back from uh, such an experience with, with information that they could not have known that could have uh, proven the, uh, the, that they really did uh, visit the afterlife. So uh, the, among the experts, uh, no one is willing to say that they have good evidence yet. That, Thank you. Uh, there's an afterlife for those experiences. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Victor Stanger and William Lane Craig. Please see our table in the back foyer. Once again, thank you and please come to our next event.